So guys, it's time to have an interesting and for some of you, maybe an uncomfortable conversation. And I'll start it by asking you guys a question. Hip hop, in my opinion, took a massive shift in around 2017. There was a big contrast, or I guess you could call it a change in the archetype of what a popular rapper sounded like and what fans expected from them. Now we know back in 2009 to 2010, the blog era emerged, which also introduced us to a brand new class of rappers who arguably outpaced the previous generation in a couple different aspects. And many of them did it by taking Kanye West's blueprint of bringing a new sense of vulnerability to the forefront and relating to the quote unquote average individual on a different level than their predecessors. The rappers at the forefront of that era, guys like J. Cole, Drake, Mac Miller, Kid Cudi, these guys, as far as I know, grew up in, at worst, a lower middle class environment. They weren't engulfed in gang violence or drug dealing. And just simply as an outsider looking in, it seemed like their creative source or their overall drive to relay their message to the masses stemmed from something much different than the quote unquote popular rappers of the previous generations. Their production and song composition was more abstract, incorporating melodies, their subject matter was more rooted in their internal struggle rather than the macro issues that plague society. So the archetype of a quote-unquote popular rapper in the 2010s related more to the average run-of-the-mill middle-class individual than a rapper ever did before. The previous generation of rappers' creative source or the drive that helped them push their message to the masses seemingly stem more from a place of rebellion against the system or an ambition or confidence to escape the hardship by any means necessary. Music was an outlet to escape the tough conditions they grew up in, and the average run-of-the-mill middle-class individual didn't necessarily relate, but were most definitely enthralled by the passion, the pain, and the dedication to the craft. I mean, before Drake was putting out Diamond albums where he's talking about drunk dialing and crying to his ex, 50 Cent was putting out Diamond albums where he was telling the world to either get rich or die trying. The most popular rapper before Drake, Lil Wayne would hit himself in the chest with a firearm because his mom told him he couldn't rap anymore. Around the same time, arguably the most iconic rapper of the 1990s, Tupac, formed a rap collective called The Outlaws. And before him, arguably the best rap collective of all time, dubbed themselves as Guys With An Attitude, aka NWA. But over 20 years later, the most promising superstar of the new 2010s class would take inspiration from all of his predecessors that I just mentioned, but he wouldn't form a collective of outlaws, he wouldn't die trying to get rich, and he wasn't a guy with an attitude. Instead, he was a good kid from a mad city. So as hip-hop in the 2010s began to shift its spotlight towards rappers with more emotionally open and relatable personas, it allowed the average listener to connect deeply with the music's message possibly on a level that the average individual never had before, allowing the genre to propel to unprecedented levels of popularity. Popularity that hit its peak in the year 2017 when it was coupled with the ease of consumption that streaming platforms brought to the average listener. But throughout the emergence of this new class of more relatable, level-headed, sensitive rappers that related to the average listener more than any rapper had before, there lied one outlier, or outlaw if you will. It slipped through the cracks, but still managed to go on to become one of the leading voices of this generation. And that would be none other than Tyler the Creator. Tyler emerged in the same era as artists like Drake, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole, who all brought vulnerability and introspection into hip-hop, resonating with that broader audience through relatable themes of love, identity, and struggle. However, Tyler took a starkly different path, distinguishing himself with a style that was dark, confrontational, and shock-driven. His earlier work with Odd Future and albums like Goblin featured aggressive, often controversial lyrics paired with eerie, minimalist beats that conveyed a rebellious, anti-mainstream persona. While Drake and Kendrick were celebrated for their open, introspective narratives, Tyler's music struck a chord with fans who were looking for something unapologetically raw and chaotic. His brash approach made him an outsider within this new wave of relatable hip-hop, but his originality and fearless exploration of taboo subjects quickly gained him a dedicated fan base. As the quote-unquote Big Three put out blockbuster albums every year throughout the 2010s, Tyler would constantly experiment and evolve his sound over those same years. And by 2017, Tyler moved towards the more melodic and emotionally nuanced style that was introduced to us on his album that year, Scum F Flower Boy. And ever since the release of Flower Boy in 2017, Tyler the Creator has shown remarkable evolution with each and every project, experimenting with genre, narrative, and production in ways 
very few other rappers have. From the soulful introspection of Flower Boy, to the genre-bending vulnerability in Igor, to the brash, braggadocious, nostalgic soundscapes of Call Me If You Get Lost, Tyler's artistry has constantly reinvented itself while expanding his creative reach. And so my question to you is, since that new era that emerged in 2017, what artists from within the big three or outside of the big three has given us a collection of projects that were as diverse, boundary testing, genre bending, or influential than Tyler has? He just dropped his brand new album, Chromacopia, and we're gonna break down all the subject matter and themes within that album within this video. But before we do that, I think it's time to be honest about Tyler, the creator. With this four album run between 2017 and 2024, starting with Flower Boy and ending now with Chromacopia, can you tell me that there's been a rapper within mainstream hip-hop that has given us a string of albums that were as diverse or carefully crafted as Tyler has? But yet, he always slips through the cracks of those big three conversations. Now, I love J. Cole, but since 2014 Forest Hills Drive, has Cole given us a project as sonically ambitious as Tyler's album Igor? Aside from possibly being a technically stronger rapper, has Cole continuously evolved his sound in the same capacity that Tyler has? Has he pushed the same boundaries from project to project? Has he given us bold storytelling records like Tyler has on records like I Thought You Wanted to Dance or Hey Jane off his new album? I think there's a very strong argument to make that Tyler the Creator has given us the strongest catalog of hip-hop albums in the entirety of the streaming era. And while his darker sound in the early 2010s rendered his music harder to digest than a lot of his peers who came up in the same era as him, I think at the very least, his last four bodies of work have been groundbreaking enough to make the argument that Tyler has now snuck his way in to the current big three of hip-hop and i love j cole this video is not meant to discredit anything he's put out in the last seven years but maybe it is get back for him criticizing kendrick lamar's whole catalog saying that to pimp a butterfly put people to sleep or that mr morale was tragic but i think again a big reason why j cole is a part of that big three is because J. Cole makes music for everybody. You could play Cole's music at parties, you could play it in the gym, you could play it in your car, you could play it while you work. Especially early on in his career, Cole was giving us hits that were a lot more conventional. Meanwhile, Tyler comes with this more avant-garde style. He doesn't have a hit like a power trip or a she knows or a no role models. He doesn't have an anthem like a middle child. I mean, look no further than Tyler's two most memorable or at least iconic hits, Earthquake and Yonkers. They showcase two very distinct sounds that reflect his artistic evolution. Yonkers from 2011 is gritty, it's abrasive, it has a dark, minimalist beat, characterized by a heavy bass line and eerie, creeping synths. The track has this raw, confrontational tone that mirrors Tyler's earlier aggressive persona, with lyrics that challenge conventions and shock listeners. His delivery on the record, it's deep, it's monotone, it's menacing, and it emphasizes that anti-establishment feel that was central to his earlier Odd Future identity. It wasn't meant to make the Billboard charts. I mean, he was even eating a bug and tying his neck to a rope in the music video. But then you fast forward to 2019 and you get Earthquake, which is this bright, soulful track with a melodic, emotionally rich sound. It featured a funky bass line, soft piano chords, groovy synths. It has this warmth and vulnerability that was very, very absent in a record like Yonkers. Tyler's singing in this high pitch. It's supplemented by guest vocals by Playboy Cardi, who's kind of just mumbling on the track. There's this layered harmony that contrasts sharply with his deadpan delivery in Yonkers. And while the song's themes of love and heartbreak reflect a more personal, introspective side, marking Tyler's growth as both an artist and an individual, regardless of how polished that record is, both of his two biggest hits highlight Tyler's journey from rebellion to introspective, genre-bending creativity. And neither of them conform to what a traditional hip-hop hit is supposed to sound like. And that's what I mean by him slipping through the cracks. I'm not talking about anything he's doing in the bedroom. But I think with his latest album, Chromacopia, Tyler's not only marking his stance as the most creative character within hip-hop, but from a mainstream perspective, he's also becoming a force to be reckoned with. He released the album in the early hours of Monday morning to make a statement that he doesn't care about getting that full tracking week of sales. Instead, he'd rather push the boundaries and influence the industry to go back to that traditional route of releasing albums earlier on in the week instead of closer to the weekends. His reason for that was Tyler thought that it's a very unfair method to drop an album at midnight on a Friday because most people are sleeping and then they get to their weekends where they don't really have the full time to digest and sit with the album. Instead, they're out either partying, going to the gym, 
doing casual activities and the music is kind of just playing in the background. Whereas on the weekday, you're kind of more stuck in this routine. You're going to work, you're going to school, you're doing whatever it is that you do on the weekday, but you have a lot more time to actually digest and unpack the album. And it's something to look forward to while you start your week. And streaming data would support this theory as songs actually get played a lot less on the weekends than they do earlier on in the week on Mondays and Tuesdays. And regardless of Tyler releasing this album in the middle of the week, and therefore only having four tracking days of sales, instead of having that full week of seven days, Chromacopia is still gearing up to be Tyler's highest selling album in the first week, as it's projected to sell anywhere from 250,000 to 300,000 copies in just four days. And this is a massive accomplishment because most rappers in today's current age with the way that streaming data collects numbers and counts them as sales, most rappers are struggling to sell 20 to 30,000 copies in their first week. And if you need further proof that Tyler is now hanging amongst the elites in terms of mainstream hip hop, look no further than the numbers that Chromacopia put up in its first day of release. It's important to note that Tyler also only released this album at 6 a.m. Eastern Time on Monday, meaning that the numbers that he put up in its first day of release were done without it even being out for a full 24 hours. But regardless, in less than 24 hours, Chromacopia was still streamed over 85 million times on Spotify in the first day that it came out. This is higher than any J. Cole album has ever been streamed in one single day, with the offseason being his highest at 62 million streams in its first day of release. And the only albums in history to have higher first day streaming numbers than Tyler were projects from Drake, Kendrick Lamar, Travis Scott, and Kanye West, showing that Tyler is selling as much as the biggest players in hip-hop today. And his ascension to one of the top spots in mainstream hip-hop is amazing to see when you actually look at the first day streaming numbers of his previous albums. When he released Flower Boy, Tyler was struggling to hit that number one spot. He was battling Meek Mill over hitting the top three of the Billboard charts that week. Flower Boy only opened up with six million streams in its first day of release. By the time 2019 hit, Tyler was also battling DJ Khaled for that number one spot on the Billboard charts, and Igor only opened up with 24 million streams in its first day of release. Call Me If You Get Lost almost doubled that with 41 million streams in its first day of release, but Chromacopia has well more than doubled Tyler's previous most successful album as it was streamed over 85 million times on Monday, October 28th. I say all that to say if Tyler hasn't yet snuck into that top three spot, of the big three, at least from a mainstream perspective, then either J. Cole or Future needs to have a massive debut with their next albums. But let's move on to the actual album itself because Tyler has shown us again that he's on a mission to evolve and bring us a new message and theme with each new project. The time that I'm recording this, the album's only been out for like a day and a half, but by the couple of listens that I've given it, to me this album sounds like it's all about maturing. Playing Call Me If You Get Lost and Chromacopia back to back reveals them as two sides of the same coin. Call Me If You Get Lost explores the appealing aspects of fame, like luxury, travel, and wealth. It was packaged as a Gangsta Girls mixtape, a series whose projects were known for their high-energy confidence, unapologetic braggadocio, and raw street-focused charisma, packed with explosive collaborations and DJ Drama's iconic shoutouts. Call Me If You Get Lost was structured the same way, with DJ Drama narrating the entire album. Meanwhile, Chromacopia delves into the vulnerability and instability behind the facade that comes with fame. Although Tyler reaches the kind of success that society admires, on this project, it seems like he finds it offers minimal personal fulfillment. During his listening party for the album, Tyler kind of explained a little bit of the inspiration behind it, and he said that a lot of the themes behind the music stem from conversations that he had with his mom as a kid and advice that she gave him early on. He said that the album kind of just turned into a bunch of stuff that his mom told him as a kid, and now that he's 33, he's like, oh, that's what she was talking about. And to me, this album is kind of like Tyler entering his unk arc, or his quote-unquote old Ted era. He also said at the listening party, like, I'm not that same guy that I was when I was 20. People are getting older, people are having kids. And this album reflects where Tyler was when he was a kid, and how he internalized his experiences and the advice that his mom gave him to become the man he is today. And this project gives fans a glimpse into Tyler's personal life and who he truly is in ways that we've never seen before, and it's all done through the introduction of his new character, St. Chroma, a character that embodies Tyler's doubts and inner conflicts, symbolized through a mask that he wears throughout all the album's visuals. The intro track, St. Chroma, quickly immerses listeners into the album's world, building tension with soulful vocals and intense drums, 
on the surface, it's a confident anthem. But when you dig deeper, especially on that second verse that wasn't featured on the music video when Tyler first released this track, the song carries themes of self-doubt, grappling with fame's limitations, and setting the stage for Tyler's anti-hero protagonist. Through the chants in the background and the driving percussion, it pulls listeners straight into the heart of Tyler's battle between self and expectation. As he raps bars like, I don't like the way that this is looking, Mirror got me thinking I'm about my bookend, I just need this time to myself to figure me out. Do I keep the light on or do I gracefully bow out? The duality of luxury and paranoia that comes from fame continues thematically on the next track, Ratata, where Tyler opens the track talking about sleeping with beautiful women, living a life of luxury and sin, and not being able to drive a Hellcat because they don't cost enough. But by the fourth verse, the paranoia starts to kick in as Tyler raps, Never tell those guys or women where you breathe at. If my ex is spilling tea about me, don't you drink that. And don't you call me brother, I just met you, you can keep that. He finishes the verse off by letting us know that he's the biggest out of his city after Kendrick Lamar. And again, just goes back to the point that I was making, man. Like, he's right behind Kendrick in that big three right now. And Tyler ends off the track by saying, Those guys used to press me on the carrot-colored bus. That's why I'm paranoid now. Because people are weird and really bums. And then we get into the slickest transition off the album as Tyler repeatedly chants that he's paranoid on the final moments of this track, and it quickly leads us into the next track called Noid, which was one of the singles off the album, which I wasn't the biggest fan of when it first released, but it fits perfectly in the context of the entire project. It's a neo-soul-infused track that both nods to Tyler's past while pushing forward with a more liberated sound. The track carries elements of his Igor style with polished melodic layers, and a storyline revolving around inner anxieties. Then we get, in my opinion, probably the best track off this album with Darling Eye. I'm calling it now, this is going to go on to be one of Tyler's biggest hits of his career. It captures that same feeling as an earthquake did off of Igor, but it's even more suitable to dominate on the global charts as it's groovier and has this more up-tempoed sound. It carries this bouncy Neptunes-inspired beat, samples Q-tip, it features beautiful vocals from Tizo Touchdown, but the song's subject matter isn't compromised by its radio-friendly production. The song kicks off with some wise words from Tyler's mother as he tells her whatever he does, never tell a girl you love her. And the track examines monogamy, self-sufficiency, and relationship conflicts, with Tyler revealing his struggle to balance personal relationships with his career as he raps, nobody could fulfill me like this music does. And while Tyler questions his ability to maintain a romantic relationship on this record, on the song right after it, he tells the story of how one night with a woman ended with him and her having to face the toughest decision of their life. Hey Jane is the story of Tyler impregnating a woman, and on the first verse, he's rapping from his perspective while speaking to his partner Jane, explaining his struggle with fear and hesitation about the responsibility that comes with raising a child. Also drawing back to the themes from the previous record, Darling I, where Tyler details his struggle with monogamy, he emphasizes it on this record as neither him or Jane had been in love with each other, they were kind of just fooling around, and as Tyler put it, they didn't make it to love yet, but they took a shortcut to forever by potentially being stuck with this unwanted child. But he also sympathizes with his partner's predicament as she's the one who has to go through the actual process of either giving birth or carrying the baby, all the physical and mental stress that comes with that, all for the baby to just carry on Tyler's last name. He flips the perspective on the second verse as he starts to rap from the woman's standpoint, and her struggles and confusion stem from the fact that she's been through this before, seemingly had to abort a child when she was 24, now she's 35, her time is ticking if she wants to have this baby, she's contemplating whether or not it makes sense to bring a child in this world, and in classic Tyler fashion, he adds a sense of humor to the record while he raps from her perspective about the type of father that Tyler could be. As he raps, you're not dumb and your energy is a good mood, but you're a little weird, but overall you're a good dude. She also mentions that she doesn't need Tyler to provide for her, she could do it for herself, but weighs out the pros and cons of potentially losing Tyler as a friend if she does end up keeping the baby. And it's refreshing to hear Tyler give us a glimpse into these stories that, you know, we've never heard from him before, and at the same time, bringing back storytelling into hip-hop. Ironically, the last rapper I remember that made a track in a similar vein about an unwanted pregnancy and rapping from both the perspective of the father and the mother was J. Cole on his 2009 track, Lost Ones. So maybe Tyler has been taking inspiration from the big three. Actually, scratch that, he most definitely has. This feels like Tyler's own version of Kendrick Lamar's 2022 record, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. We're hearing Tyler touch on issues like paranoia, relationships, 
relationships and opening up emotionally in ways that are much more deep and introspective than we've ever heard him do on previous records. Both Chromacopia and Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers act as therapy sessions for the two respective rappers, with Chromacopia being narrated by Tyler's mother as she's giving him advice throughout the entire album, and he takes us through this journey of his experiences and how that advice impacted him later on, whether or not he ever ended up listening to it. And while this album touches on much darker themes than Tyler has done in the past, he does so with very bright production. Based off the teasers for this album and the new character that Tyler introduced, I thought we'd be getting a much more sinister project. And while the subject matter is serious, vulnerable, and at sometimes dark, they're carried by these lush, lighthearted, warm sonics. The next track, I Killed You, continues touching on themes of struggling with self-identity and societal expectations. The next track, Judge Judy, again features this lighthearted harmony on the chorus and on the production side, and starts off with Tyler singing about this girl that he likes, that he pursues, and they have fun together, but by the end of the track, she reveals to him that she had cancer and passed away. Again, there's this very interesting balance of up-tempo production with very dark, serious subject matter. Kind of like the duality that Tyler struggles with at the beginning of the album between the luxuries that come with fame, but the simultaneous paranoia and anger that lurks in the shadows. And on a side note, without glancing at the feature list, I really thought that was Frank Ocean singing on the hook of Judge Judy. And I feel like Tyler has done this a couple times where he either pitches his vocals to sound like Frank Ocean, or maybe when he sings he really does sound like Frank Ocean and I just haven't been listening deep enough this entire time. Let me know in the comments if I'm missing something there. And there's many other highlights on this album, one of them being on the song Take Your Mask Off, which is a song that explores the various masks that people wear to conceal their true thoughts or feelings. Tyler takes the perspective of a thug who acts tough to fit in, then he switches to a church preacher who's hiding his sexuality, then to a single mom who's worn down by her role as a mother, eventually shifting the focus back to Tyler himself, exposing some of his own personal struggles. Each of these various characters, just like Tyler, face inner turmoil and self-sabotage, and through the jazz-inflected melodies, the song becomes a call for authenticity, urging listeners to embrace their flaws and their insecurities. Tyler questions whether these characters represent people in his life, aspects of St. Chroma, or fragments of himself, leaving the interpretation open to the listener. Then we get into Sticky, one of the most interesting records off this album. And if you guys watched my last video about Tyler, when he just announced Chromacopia, I said that one of the features I was hoping to see on this record was Lil Wayne. But instead of just putting him on an interlude like he did on Call Me If You Get Lost off the record Hot Wind Blows, I wanted to see a full-fledged track between the two where they were rapping side by side like they did on Smuckers with Kanye West. And, I mean, we got that, kind of. But Lil Wayne only had about four bars. The track also featured Glorilla and Sexy Red. It had this mean mugging southern rap beat. And the production suits Lil Wayne perfectly. Like he sounds like he went back to no ceilings with that cartoony high energy delivery. But in my opinion, because he was a standout on this record and fit it so perfectly, Tyler should have given him a longer verse. And the overall record was a little too repetitive and TikTok friendly for my liking. I could definitely see this one doing well on the charts as well. I just don't know if it's going to be something I go back to so often. It kind of reminds me of Hot Shower by Chance the Rapper. Like, it's cartoony and it's catchy, but I feel like it's kind of catchy for all the wrong reasons. And I don't know if I've ever heard Tyler dumb down his style this much. But the album definitely continues on a high note, especially on the record Thought I Was Dead, which features a verse from Schoolboy Q. And this record is kind of like Tyler's F you to the industry. On the beginning of this album, Tyler was rapping about how you couldn't really trust anyone that came around you, People who didn't even know him were acting like his friends. And by the end of this album on this record, he repeats on the chorus that he doesn't want to be found. He doesn't want to be down. He doesn't want anything to do with you guys. On the third verse, Tyler also makes reference to his comments that he made earlier this year about the rapper named Ian. If you guys don't know who Ian is, he's basically a cheap clone of Yeet, who's a cheap clone of Playboy Cardi, who's arguably these days a cheap clone of Future. Tyler commented on the vulturistic approach that Ian took to his music, as he was a white boy, probably from the suburbs, who was cosplaying as Playboy Cardi. People kind of had mixed feelings on these comments, with some people saying that Tyler was kind of just an old head, hating on the new generation. But again, this album is all about Tyler entering that Ankh era. He's 33 now, he's an old head, he doesn't have time for this new generation. And on the third verse of this record, he starts it off by rapping, white boys mocking this stuff, and you guys are mad at me? Y'all can suck my D. Pull up old tweets, pull up old t-shirts. All that, I'll moonwalk over that. And that's probably because when Tyler wasn't an old head, back when he was young in 2010, he definitely had a lot of controversial tweets. But here he's basically saying, 
I don't really care what I said when I was younger. Pull it all up, I'll moonwalk over it. I can't be cancelled. And while both Schoolboy Q and Lil Wayne had dope features on this album, the feature that, if it's not the best, is definitely the most brash, comes on the 13th record called Balloon, which had an appearance from Dochi. And I'm very happy he put Dochi on this record, man. We need more artists like Dochi in 2024. If you guys have been keeping up with this channel, then you probably watched my video called The Next Kendrick Lamar, where I was comparing Dochi's rise today to Kendrick's rise when he just dropped his 2011 mixtape, Section 80. Dochi just dropped her latest mixtape, Alligator Bites Never Heal, in the summer of this year, and I highly suggest you guys check it out. This woman does everything. She sings like an R&B singer. She does boom bap. She can also rap like a hybrid of Nicki Minaj, Missy Elliott, and Tyra, the creator himself. She's telling stories. She carries a whole concept throughout her mixtape. But just like Tyler, she keeps it playful and funny. Like, even on this record with Tyler, she rapped, I air this out like a queef. Definitely the most outlandish bar on this entire album. The same album that featured Sexy Red saying she doesn't fight over respect, she fights over male's private parts. But yeah, since I released that video saying that the world needs to pay attention to Dochi, she hopped on a Tyre the Creator song, and she got a shout out from Kendrick Lamar himself. And with the lack of subject matter, diversity, and the value of concepts within your projects, I really think we need an artist like Dochi to blow up in the mainstream and set the standard a little higher for what artists today need to be doing. But yeah, overall, this was an incredible listen front to back. I've spun this album maybe three times so far, sat with the lyrics for a little bit, but definitely not enough to be able to unpack the full theme and all the concepts and subject matter that went into this project. Even with a short three listens, I think this is easily contender for one of the best rap albums of the year. And again, I think it's time that we be honest about Tyler and start mentioning him in those conversations of who the top players are today in hip hop that are not only pushing the genre forward, but also dominating in every aspect, delivering hits, strong full length projects, and constant artistic evolution with each new record. Now, if you watched my video on Future's latest project, Mixtape Pluto, then you know in the Rapaholics community, we don't rate albums on a scale from 1 to 10. We got the 6 W scales, because just the fact that we're getting new music from our favorite artists is a W in and of itself, and each W represents a different ranking. The top ranking is wonderful. This is like an absolute classic project. You finish listening to this and you're like, this is wonderful. I feel wonderful. The whole experience was wonderful. Every single element of this album was wonderful. That's like a 10 out of 10. Lower than that, we got a woe. That's like an 8 to 9 out of 10. You were blown away, but it's missing something that makes it perfect. Lower than that, we got Wow, which is like a 7 out of 10. This is a great project. You'll probably go back to a bunch of songs, but you might not ever bump the album front to back, or it doesn't stand the test of time as a classic. Then the next tier is Weird. This is like a 5 out of 10, where you kind of left the experience feeling a little bit weird and wondering where your favorite artist would go next. It's not bad by any means, it just left you with a weird feeling and confused on how that album would impact this artist's legacy. Then you got Weak, this is like a 3 out of 10, no real need to explain it, just a weak project. And then the final tier is going to be Whack. This is like a 0 out of 10, no redeemable qualities whatsoever, just a straight up Whack project. On this scale, I'd probably give Chromacopia anywhere between a wow and a woe. A lot of records off the project blew me away, especially songs like Darling Eye, Thought I Was Dead, Ballooned, and Hey Jane. Those are probably my favorites off the first few listens. I love the maturity on the record. I love that Tyler's opening up about stories, experiences, and feelings that he never really has shared with us before. And it's obviously way too early to say if this is a classic from this generation or not, or if it even fesses up as Tyler's best album. But what's definitely certain is that on Chromacopia, Tyler's sound design shines. There's plenty of sharp, diverse production choices, which are very unique to Tyler's previous work. And the album is extremely introspective and raw. It addresses plenty of themes of fame, ego, self-doubt, vulnerability, and more. And with Chromacopia, Tyler offers us a complex, multi-dimensional look at fame and personal identity, easily making it one of his most revealing projects to date. And with this crazy four album run that we just got from Tyler, I think it's time to put a little more respect on his name and start taking that question a little more seriously of where Tyler truly stands amongst the greats and where he'll take us on his next project. Let me know what you guys think about the album and let me know, did Tyler replace J. Cole in that big three? I think I still go back to J. Cole's music a little more often because again, he is a more accessible artist. But this four album run that Tyler just went on has been impeccable and has definitely cemented him amongst the greats of his generation. But let me know what you guys think and I'll catch you guys in the next one.
there's a lot of little nuggets in both of their disses that if it wasn't for these breakdowns and salutes to you know guys like this rapaholics because i think they directly get it